I'd like to welcome anyone who might be visiting us here this morning. We're grateful to have you. We are studying through Paul's letter to the Romans. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 1, this morning we kind of begin his, Paul's unfolding of the gospel that he's told us he's not ashamed of. We looked at last week in verse 16. My prayer is that it would fall afresh and deeper and with more power upon us that we would see the beautiful glory of this salvation, uh, to live by faith. That is how the just shall live in this gospel. Accordingly, my prayer is that we would be equipped to share this gospel. Uh, we're working on memorizing the scriptures. Your, your verse this week was verse 18. And it's to, to put verses with these truths that we're going to be learning. And so I, I don't want you to just learn a cold formula with the gospel. I want you to understand it, its doctrines, its realities, with verses to, to put with it so that you'll be able to, to share this gospel, a digested gospel that knows it and lives it and believes it. And now you can actually, when you're ministering to people with it, you can listen and you can hear their thoughts, their fears, their struggles to bring this gospel remedy. And you don't have a canned formula and be like, wait, wait, go back to, to this point or that point. And I did that at, at seminary and it just doesn't work very well. So my heart is that you're, you're getting this and you're cementing it in your heart and your mind so that you can proclaim it to others. So do we turn first uh, to Paul's first section now of the gospel that we're not ashamed of. And we're going to take a tour really through the human heart in Romans 1.18 all the way to chapter 3, verse 20. And we're going to be dealing with sin and, and condemnation and guilt and unrighteousness. And we're not going to spend five years on it, but we will look close enough that I want everyone in this room to see your own mugshot in Romans 1 through 3. And we will look near enough so the full glory and beauty of this gospel will break forth in every heart where we will live in forever praise of the salvation from this wrath that we will begin looking at this morning to where this becomes bigger than anything else in my life, my lusts, my retirement plan. I want this gospel to have the right place in every heart. That's what we're after in Romans. A superficial diagnosis of your problem will bring false remedies and not a true cure. You'll, you'll live shallow in the gospel if you don't understand this truth. So I want you to journey with me in this section of the unrighteousness of humanity. You can suppress the truth, Paul will say, by unrighteousness this morning. And in chapter 2, you can suppress the truth by self-righteousness in the Word of God claiming to be Christians. And Paul's going to go after both. He's going to go to the slum and to the sanctuary, to the righteous and the unrighteous. He wants everyone to see their standing before this God that we're all in the exact same need of this salvation that Paul's unashamed of. So I want to open this morning with a quote from one of the greatest ministers in the world of the last hundred years, and his name was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. <laughs> Lloyd-Jones saw a beautiful revival in his time of ministry over in Europe. And this is from an interview in 1980 by a man named Carl Henry. He was a writer for Christianity Today. At the time, Jones was 80 years old. He's going to die just a few years later, and he's had a long, faithful life. And he's going to answer some of these following questions that I wanted us to hear this morning. Dr. Jones, what do you think Christianity ought to say to the economic situation today that we find ourselves in? He said, the great message we must preach is God's judgment on men and on the world. He went on to say, the world proves more and more than ever that we must preach escape from the wrath to come. Can Christians influence and create a Christian culture, doctor? No, it never will come. All scripture is against it. It's impossible. The present world situation is a collapse morally, politically, and in every other way. I would have thought at this time our urgent message should be to escape from the wrath that is to come. And in the close of the interview, <coughs> what parting word do you have for the secular man or woman who does not take Jesus Christ seriously? And Jones said, flee from the wrath to come and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. How far has this gotten from our thinking? 
Has the gospel become just a remedy to save me from a bad life? To help me with addictions? To make me happier when I think about God? To give me a purpose? Friends who are nice and vote the same way? Music that moves me or, or gives me a, a moral code? Romans 12, Paul's going to say, don't be conformed to this world and the way it thinks. Our world has removed retributive justice from its thinking. Because the, we're at a place where there are no right and wrongs, how can there be justice and, and, and punishment for wrongdoing? The church has been tempted and gave up in some camps to remove the wrath of God from its declarations. We've, been, we've moved to a therapeutic approach instead of the gospel that Paul is unashamed of. The gospel that he says is of God. This is God's gospel. We don't tamper, we don't change it, we don't make it palatable. Are we ashamed of the wrath of God and do we apologize for it? I want to look together this morning at this man named Paul rejoicing over the good news of God, eager to preach this gospel in Rome because it's the power of God to bring men into the realm of salvation. Salvation from what, Paul? <laughs> salvation from the wrath of God. Salvation from God himself. So may God meet us here this morning in truth and align our hearts and our thinking with his and may he do more for us than we can ever hope or think and may he transform our minds from the way the world thinks and to open up this word this morning and let it have its way in every heart, I pray. Let's go to our God. Father, what is before us is sobering. And it rolls into this glorious gospel that we are amazed at. And so I pray, Lord, there are going to be some who don't want to hear this. And they're going to want to push it out. And they're going to want to go have a drink and forget about what is being told from the God and the creator of this universe. And so, God, I pray that there is a way to look at this. Because you are a God who has given a remedy from it. Lord, don't let them run this morning to something else to fix this reality. They're all lies. They will not work. They cannot remove the wrath of God. Let every heart in this room this morning stare at the remedy that has been given in Christ Jesus for every sinner under the wrath of Almighty God. God, meet us and have your way with us this morning. Amen. Well, I want to introduce our first section that we will begin this morning where do we begin with the gospel? Paul said in this gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed from faith to faith. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is that such good news? Why is the righteousness of God being revealed a treasure hidden in a field which will sell everything that we might have it? Why is it the best news that Paul would be beaten and stoned and head cut off for this gospel? Why do you give your life to this? Because there's something else that's being revealed. The righteousness of God is being revealed daily. And so is the wrath of God being revealed. And this morning in verse 18, we're told against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. We are unrighteous. We're born into this world not right with God. We have scoliosis spiritually. We're twisted. And we live in accordance with our separation from God. We are enemies and we are rebels against the Creator. God's wrath then is being revealed against us daily. So you need to understand the section we're beginning. Paul will labor hard to show that we are all unrighteous. Every one of us, everyone who has ever been born from Adam comes in this world unrighteous, separated from God with his wrath upon us whether you are a Gentile or a Jew, whether you reject God and run from him and suppress him, you're sitting here maybe this morning, even an atheist, and you don't know why you're here, or you're a, a Jew who has the law and you boast in it, you boast in your morality, thinking that it's going to accomplish something for you. Paul's going to conclude this whole section in Romans 3, verse 9. What then, are we better than they, the Jews and Gentiles? Not at all. For we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under the dominion of sin. 
As it is written, there is none righteous. No, there's not even one. And then jump down to verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced before God and all the world might become accountable to this God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for through the law only comes the knowledge of sin. There's no way out from the situation that we're going to look at this morning in, in our hands. Man does not hold the key to remove the wrath of God from them. Every false religion and every false thought puts a key in your hand and says, here's how you fix your problem in some humanistic way. And there's just a bunch of lies out there with keys that don't even fit the door. Paul's going to later say this. What shall we say? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, <coughs> they didn't even go after it. They attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. They believed the gospel. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness given by Moses, did not arrive at the law. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They, they looked at the law and they tried to become good people and obey the law to get righteousness. And they stumbled over the stumbling stone, Jesus Christ. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he who believes in him will not be astonished. And the Gentiles are believing on him and they're getting saved. They're getting righteousness. And these Jews are looking to the law, looking to religion, trying to clean up and be good people. And they're missing it because they don't get by faith in what Christ has done. We are a people who are unrighteous. I need you to wear that this morning. You can't change your nature. You can't change it. Self is the center reference point, and all you can do is shuffle the furniture on the Titanic. You can't make your heart not be selfish. You can't change your record that you inherited from Adam. You can't change your actions that come from the heart for the right reason. You can't just serve because you love God. You're trying to earn His love. We can't give God the righteousness that he requires. He requires a perfect righteousness to be in his presence. You cannot do it. You're going to come short and you're under the wrath of God and you're, you're, you're unrighteous and you're separated from him. And because of it, because of sin, the wrath of God is upon us in our verse this morning. And you need to feel it. And you need to sense it and understand it and sit under it. I don't want you to just go, oh, that's a nice truth. I memorized that doctrine. That's called the doctrine of depravity. <laughs> Big deal. Do you feel it? Is it you? Is this a description of you outside of Adam, uh, outside of Christ, what you were in Adam? Have you tried to labor out from under this problem? Or you finally realize not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. You need a gospel in, in which it has the power to save you from this wrath and it gives you a righteousness that now you can stand before this God wrapped in the righteous garment of Christ, accepted and loved and children of God. I'm not ashamed of it because it can bring you out from under the wrath that we're going to look at this morning. It can bring you into this place where you can stand in grace, accepted and loved by God. I could care less about anything else but this gospel. The gospel is a way for God to forgive your sins and bring you back into a relationship. And he can still be just as he justifies you before the throne of grace. Paul's going to move this whole message to that. So here's the history. As I've been just, It's bad to give me time to meditate. I'm sorry. I've just been thinking all week. and I just, Here's the history to me in a nutshell. Righteousness is being revealed. For all of history now, men and women and children are being saved. They're, they're believing in Christ. And there's just a bunch of you here this morning. You're, you're getting saved and you're being made right with God. It just keeps getting revealed from generation to generation. That's the hope for our children this morning. I want children to enter into this righteousness that's being revealed. Wrath is being revealed from the fall. 
There's instant separation, dead. Adam and Eve uh, away from God. They, the, the, the sin then spreads and grows and God brings a flood upon the whole earth. And he saves eight. And today, righteousness <coughs> will end. And it's gonna, we're, gonna end, we're gonna end in a place that says where righteousness dwells forever. And we're going to go to a place where there's no more unrighteousness. Christ is the light of the world. He's the, the, so righteousness is being revealed and it ends in eternal perfect righteousness forever that we're going to bask in for eternity. How's that? With perfect worked out righteousness by us forever. Not bad. And wrath is going to end. And it's going to end in an eternal unleashing and a place that grows in unrighteousness for all of eternity. And it's going to grow in enmity and hatred toward God. And wrath is going to be poured out in this place forever where the worm will never die and the fires are never quenched. That's history. That's what's going on this morning in this place. It kind of sets priorities quickly, doesn't it? Maybe some of the priorities you walked in here with this morning are, shouldn't be your main ones whether you get that job, whether you had to celebrate a Valentine's Day as a single. It's just not as big. This is the most important and eternal issue in your life. My own heart and the gospel of God. So I want you to hear this. The gospel is not the wrath of God. The gospel is a rescue from the wrath of God by the power and the mercy and grace of our God through His Son, Jesus Christ. My greatest joy is that God is not just just. He's merciful. He's not just wrathful. He has a way to forgive sinners because of this grace that is in His heart. Until you see the wrath of God as being revealed and culminating and an eternal, unending severity of wrath for your twisted soul, you will always come short of this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. If you keep pushing this truth away, you'll never drink as deeply as you should of this gospel. And this is, this is where awakening begins. When God wakes us up to this. So do you see the gloriousness of Romans 1-3? through Why do we need a section like this? Why, why the world and church needs to hear this in truth is that we would flee from the wrath to come as Lloyd-Jones said and we would run to Jesus Christ for a salvation from his wrath there is a rescue from the wrath of God in Jesus Christ so let's take it up together and pray that God will reveal the depth of the beauty of this rescue that we have fled to or that we need to this morning for anyone who still sits under the wrath of God, I'm praying this morning that you would be awakened to your peril and you would give no, no thoughts to anything else except this until you know that this has been removed from you. Well, you don't need to hide such a truth. I'm unashamed of it. We don't have to hide it because we have a gospel that can save from it. So don't run from it. Run to God's remedy for it. And so my prayer is that no one will avoid this truth and just explain it away. I don't want you to get rid of it in a false way. I don't want you to find a false cure when God has provided a remedy in His Son. And so I pray that everyone in this room would look to the only remedy as we close out. Let's pray now. Father, I pray that You now will meet us in a powerful way. I pray that you would be revealing these truths this morning, that wrath would be revealed. God, that people would see it and that righteousness would be revealed and that everyone would marvel and gaze by faith at the gospel of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God. So Lord, please come and do what only you can do. Sort out every heart. I know these are difficult subjects and some who shouldn't will, will, will be buried by it. And some who should are going to wink at it and walk out. So God, I pray that you'll take care of each soul and do exactly what they need. God, be with the saints of God and be with those who do not know God this morning. 
Do your mighty work, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 1.18, your outline for this morning, <coughs> Paul unfolds three important facts about God's wrath. We're going to look at the reality of God's wrath, the revelation of God's wrath and the recipients of God's wrath this morning. And then next week, if, if God should tarry and we're still alive, we're going to look at verses 19 through 23 of what, what is this truth that we're suppressing? We'll go into that deeper and look at it. This morning, I just want to begin with the reality of God's wrath. It's a reality that God has unfolded in His Word. He speaks often and clearly about it and with absolute certainty. It is a subject that we don't like to talk about and, and really don't like to think about. Our society has done a great job of, remo of removing our need to even think about it, and we are eating the fruits as a society and as parents. Why have people become so indifferent to the gospel in our day and age? Because there's been a removal of the wrath of God. We've, we've lost an understanding of true biblical justice. The church growth movement beginning in the 80s began to just talk to, to people about palatable things, nice things, helpful things that will help you deal with stress and anxieties, and the church became a country club, not a rescue mission from the wrath of God. It did a major shift, and it just became therapeutic instead of a rescue mission. The word propitiation, it causes people to roll their eyes. I've heard people say, that's just such a big word. Who cares about propitiation? I just care that God is love. <laughs> his love, it says because He's love, He propitiated our sins. <laughs> the wrath, His wrath for our sins. Propitiation means to appease the wrath of God. So His wrath is revealed and Jesus has propitiated it. He's drained it. He took it away from the, the believer. The cross is nullified if you throw away the wrath of God. Instead of tears streaming down because wrath was revealed against me and Jesus drained every last drop on the cross for even my sins. I hear all the time, I'm not perfect. I've got some weaknesses. Positive thinking is really the key. I get it. I have some sin, but wrath is so outdated. It's an archaic, unevolved uh, thought. An eternal hell has caused many in the church to come up with a doctrine then that dismisses it. We don't like it. it it's against society. It's against, we just don't even want to think about it. And there's just all over the church today, people are saying hell is just, you're away from the presence of God. You don't get His mercy. You don't get His, His grace. Wrath of God is an active, present reality for all of eternity. And you can't dismiss it. It's for a cover to cover. Paul, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Where do we begin, Paul? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Oh, I don't like that. It's really, I think, why we have so few Martin Luthers today. Men who wrestled under the weight of who God was in his own sin and almost brought him to a sickness because he had to get out from under it. I just love when I have someone come for counseling under the tyranny of this wrath, looking for rescue. It's a rare thing in our day and age. We've done much harm to the church and the world in our own hearts by not letting this have its place in the gospel where God puts it. It's to, it's to set you free. It's to bless you. This isn't to make you miserable. It's being revealed. Psalm 90, who understands the power of thy anger and thy fury according to the fear that is due thee, O God. So teach us to number our days that we might present to thee a heart of wisdom. Help us to live right in light of who you are, O God. God's wrath is revealed. At creation, Adam and Eve were banished. And there was a sword of justice put for them to come back in the presence of God. The whole earth was flooded because of the iniquities of the world. Moses says, God, show me your glory. And he says, I'm slow to anger, great in power, but will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. His wrath is being revealed. And I want you to hear this. Sin does not slip through the cracks of God's justice. 
Every single sin in the history of the world must be answered for, and you're either going to answer it yourself or it will be answered in a Redeemer. That is what separates humanity. But every sin will be answered by the justice and wrath of God. God gave Moses the law, and in it the righteousness of God was revealed. But his wrath was revealed in punishment for all who broke the righteousness of God. His righteousness is revealed by the removal of wrath by a substitutionary atonement for Israel. Chastisement upon Israel throughout the Old Testament by other nations and plagues and serpents for their unrighteousness. The prophets warned of the wrath that would come upon Israel and and the coming day of the Lord and the great day of wrath that will be coming. I want you to hear this. J.I. Packer wrote a book called Knowing God, one of the best chapters I've ever read on the love of God. And he has a chapter on wrath. And he said, just as God is good to those who trust him, so he's terrible to those who do not. God will fulfill all righteousness and the glory of His name. As many think today, wrath is not God being vindictive. It's not irrational. It's not capricious. It's not cruel. It's not a celestial bad temper. It's not unnecessary. It's not wounded pride. It's not irritability. It's not a frustrated weakness. My friends, the wrath of God is an attribute of God. And like all of his attributes, they're perfect. It's as much a part as his love, his mercy, and his grace, and his goodness. It's the divine expression of his holiness and justice towards sin. And it's the right response from his perfect being of who he is. I want you to listen to some New Testament, because sometimes I hear that God is just a God of wrath in the Old Testament. In John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And John 3.35, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God, present tense, is abiding upon him. Ephesians 5, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things of immorality and idolatry, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. In 2 Thessalonians 1, God will come back and give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Revelation 6, all the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, the lamb that was slain. Hide us from that wrath. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is going to be able to stand? And they're going to be running and saying, I wish the mountains would fall on us, protect us from the wrath of God. I prayed with a young man this morning before service and he wept over how many will just be saying mountains fall upon us, hide us from this wrath when there's this day a way to have that wrath removed. The definition of wrath is God's holy revulsion and a holy reaction to whatever is unholy. It's God's righteous response to unrighteousness. It's God's wrath and his personal attitude and his activity toward sin. If he didn't have this, he would be not God. So hear this. His wrath is not a mechanical process. His wrath is it's a result of God personally It's an intense, settled hatred against sin. God is not indifferent to sin. He's incensed by it. His very being and his attributes demand it. And it's precise, and it gives mankind exactly what they deserve. It's not exaggerated. This is what they deserve from his righteous being and his revulsion, what he must do as God. And it's mighty, and it's dreadful. It's not just to the grave. The soul that sins must die, but this wrath is going to pursue you for all of eternity. 
Do not fear them, Jesus said, who can kill the body, but fear him who can kill both body and soul in hell. Fear the God of wrath if you're not reconciled to him this morning. This isn't a game. And your flimsy little arguments are going to melt away when you stand before this God. People might clap and cheer today, and you might feel great about all your excuses, but when you stand before this God, they're going to melt. They're going to be nothing. And they're going to say, remember that crazy preacher at Southside Bible Church who told you? You're going to stand there one day and your excuses aren't going to work. But God has a remedy. To really understand God's wrath, I want you to come with me to Gethsemane. <clears throat> the Son of God is about to die and in His humanity, His deity, He looks into the cup of wrath that He's about to go drink on that cross. And that cup is the wrath of God for our iniquities. As He looks into it, we, we see Him wreathing on the ground in, in prayer and distress. His holy soul that's obedient to the Father asks if it's possible, is there any other way to bring about salvation from your wrath? God, let it be done. But not my will, your will be done. Blood starts breaking out of his pores as he's looking at this cup. What will that cup do to you when it's poured out upon your eternal soul and to know that you rejected the offer of a way to have it removed. If it baptized Jesus into a bloody sweat, what is it going to do to you on that day when you stand before it? Thomas Boston said, to be damned by him who came to save sinners is to be doubly damned. The wrath of the Lamb. And the sheer tear, terror of him hanging on a cross, drinking that cup and crying out, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? The terror of that cry will be the eternal cry of the one who has rejected so great a salvation. To take this out of the gospel of God is to gut it. It's to gut it. It's to destroy it. And it's to do great harm to such a beautiful gospel. And so I pray, don't you dare. I'm unashamed of this gospel, said Paul. It's a gospel that can remove the wrath of God. So much so that when he gets to Romans 8, he can say there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's not even a drop left for you because his son will drain every last drop of that cup. That's the reality of God's wrath. Secondly, I want to look at the revelation of God's wrath in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We're going to take a look at that next week, what that all means, but uh, it's important to see as we begin this series, this section. This is the exact same word that we saw last week in verse 17. It's in the exact same tense. That's no small deal. Uh, two simultaneous revelations going on in our world right now in these present tense. The righteousness of God is being revealed and the wrath of God is being revealed. So even this morning, we have saving, saving revelation being revealed of the righteousness of God being offered to you to stand in favor in God's grace. It's being revealed, it's being told, and it needs to be received. And at the same time, there's a damning revelation of the wrath of God that brings condemnation for anyone who will stand before this God in your own stuff, your own goodness, your own merit. So wrath is being revealed. And as I said last week, that word, it's, it's, it's not an informational disclosure. It's not, I didn't know that, and now in my mind I understand wrath. Last week we said the saving revelation of God's righteousness, it's not just truth, it is, but it's a righteousness literally imputed to your account that really gives you a standing of justified before God. It, it, it acts, it does something, it brings about salvation. So it's the activity of God. And wrath is the same way. It's not now I understand this, it's the same word. It's not informational, but it's an operational disclosure. It's a historical disclosure. It's been manifested in the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah and the plagues with Moses. The history of the world is the judgment of God upon it. 
It's the hand of God that's being revealed against unrighteousness and it's ongoing. It's a present tense. It's being revealed even this morning. And so I want you to get this. <laughs> Righteousness is being revealed in our day. How lovely are the feet of them who bring glad tidings of good news. It's being revealed. It's being told daily. All over the world this morning, righteousness is being revealed. But wrath is being revealed even in our church. It's an ongoing matter. It's current. It's constantly taking place. God is not an uninterested spectator sitting back watching. The psalmist says God is angry with the wicked every day. He takes no breaks from his attributes. Part of this revelation, as we'll look at next week in detail, is just it'll, it'll be uh, the de de devolving degeneration of men, mankind, a progressive spiritual dementia, a moral darkening. Three times we'll see in our passage, God gave them over. <clears throat> he gives them over. He gives them over because they, they know there's a God and they suppress it and they won't give him glory or thanks. And, then, and they're given over. And they, they run into all kinds of moral degradation and sin and evil. I've heard the saying, if God doesn't judge America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, what is it, forgiveness or explanation? I'm telling you, God is judging America. And the way we know the wrath of God is being revealed, we'll look at the sins that, that happen when you're given over and they characterize our country. And I pray they don't characterize our hearts this morning. So in our world, daily is an active abandoning of God in our society. His wrath in judgment and in time upon mankind, as rejectors of God, they exchange the truth for a lie. And it's happening in our day, present tense, that God will give mankind over to what they choose over Him. Just keep saying, I, I want my little lusts. I, I want this more than you, God. I, I don't need you. I want this. I want that. And you just keep choosing everything other than God. And there's a time where God says, you don't want me? Okay, I'm going to let you go. It's like a, a steering wheel out of alignment. I'm just going to let it go its own course. And you're going to drown in it. You're going to drown in sin. Some of you sit here this morning and you're, you're just drowning in sin and the destruction, the wrath upon you because you won't bow your knee to this God and your life is a shipwreck. That is the wrath of God, uh, letting it fall apart. You don't want God. He's letting you have what life is like without him. And this morning, his message to you is there's a remedy of salvation. The sorrow and the chaos of this world breaks my heart. I, I, watched, I, I don't ever watch these, but I watched the State of the Union address. It had been a while. And I'm watching these two sides that hate each other. And they, it seemed like one side clapped for everything and the other side didn't. And then there were some on the other side who, who actually clapped once in a while, a couple of them. And then there was a few times where everybody clapped. And one of them was because they planted 10,000 trees or something like that. And right after they all clapped, he says, and I will make sure that no, the unborn will be fought for and they will not be killed in the womb. And everyone went silent on that other we clap for trees, but we, we don't care about babies being killed in a womb. My heart just breaks at what our society has become and where we're at in our own hearts. There's wrath that's being revealed on a daily basis, present tense to our nation. And it's just anticipating a greater wrath that's to come. And so the wrath of God giving us over in our sin, and devouring each other, are pre-tremors of what is to come when he actively brings that wrath upon us for all of eternity. There was an example I came across this week of a guy named Harry Truman, not Harry S. Truman, the president. <coughs> but this guy was 52 years old and he owned a little house and it wasn't far from Mount St. Helens. And on May 18, 1980, he was warned by the U.S. Geological Service, get away from that mountain. The ground is quaking and burning, and it's going to blow in the very near future. And Truman did nothing. He said, there's a lake between me and the mountain. <laughs> Same excuses today. No, it isn't really going to get me. And he became a celebrity. The news and everybody, just his defiance and what he was doing, and everyone was all excited, and then it blew. 
and Truman was buried under 150 feet of volcanic debris. The wrath of God is being revealed. There's tremors and rumblings and shakings of a world and a society that are falling apart in sin and iniquity and chaos. And the gospel is pointing to a mountain that no one can escape from. There's a day of wrath coming. And unless you believe in the other revelation of God, that the righteousness of God is being revealed, there's a gospel. There's a way to be saved from the wrath to come. There's a way to be clothed in his righteous garments and to stand in his presence safe. There's, there's, it's coming. Mr. Truman is a picture of the foolish complacency of this world. And this is the issue. Guys, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So that's the, the third point, the reality of God's wrath, the revelation of God's wrath, and we'll close with the recipients of God's wrath. And in verse 18, it's all ungodliness, all of it, and all of the unrighteousness of men. <coughs> that is what brings his wrath. So I want you to hear it. God's wrath is not willy-nilly, but it's a righteous response to unrighteousness. The Greek word for ungodliness means impiety, a disregard for the majesty of God and his person. The world will see it. They won't give glory to God. And then the unrighteousness is the rebellion and the lawlessness. No regard for the will of God and the ways of God. I will not have God in my thoughts or before me. I'm the master of my own fate. I'm the captain of my own ship. The wrath of God is against you if that is your case. Man in his autonomy, man in his neglect and his indifference to God says he will acknowledge God no longer in our text. He'll give him no glory or thanks. We'll receive all of his gifts and will not thank him. And all of his revelation of himself in creation, you won't give him glory and you exchange him for your own idols, for the own, the own things that your heart wants to treasure and love above God and you'll give up the truth for a lie and that is sin. And so have you dealt with this? You can't ignore it or repudiate it. It doesn't alter its reality. I want you to hear that. You can do whatever you want in your mind. You can play whatever tricks you want, but you cannot change this reality. You are sitting in it and you're dying. And there's a rescue for anyone in that place this morning. Please don't run from this reality. God has revealed it. God has revealed this. So what must we do to be saved from the wrath of God? We must believe the other revelation, the gospel, that God has a way to make you righteous. There's a way, instead of your own righteousness, there's a way to be clothed in His and in righteousness to put His own Son up on a cross and to be just and to punish our sins. And now He can justify us and declare us not guilty before Himself. There, there is a way to have your wrath removed this morning. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to Him. Believe. Repent from all the wrong thinking and suppressing, doing your own thing and ruling your own life. This morning, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from the wrath that is to come. At the table, all I could think of is Christ on that cross. He drank the cup. That cup that baptized him into a bloody sweat, he, he drank every last drop of God's wrath for our sin. So now he holds a cup out to you at the table as the cup of mercy, the cup that for, has forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me for the blood that was poured out so that you'll have no wrath ever come upon your head. Only the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. I hold out to you God's gospel concerning his son. And I pray that no one would walk out of here without believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved from God. I'm going to close with just a couple thoughts of application. Here's what kind of God did with me this week. God hates sin this much. I just, it just alarmed me again to how holy God is and how much he hates sin. The more I meditate on hell, all I can see is the holy revulsion of God and how much he hates it. 
And if you love him, you must hate it with the same vehemence that God does. And so we need an awakening in our hearts this morning is how can I make peace with what God hates? Have you made a peace treaty with sin and you just sit here in defiance? I pray that this truth would just cause you to say, I gotta hate what God hates and love what God loves. Hate sin. See it for what it is and give everything of your being to fight against it. Second, we we learned that Paul was a debtor to all of humanity. He owed a debt to tell them of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want you this morning to bring that back to your mind and realize you're a debtor to people that are under this wrath. When, When they're saying mountains fall upon us, hide, get me away from this wrath, and you say, you know, I just was too busy. I want you to let this go in deeper that you're a debtor to people who are under the wrath of God. It's not just a little thing. It's not that you're right and they're wrong. That righteousness is being revealed to you and wrath is still being revealed to them. And so I'm a debtor to tell people about the rescue from this wrath to come in Jesus Christ. Thirdly, is I want you to have an eternal joy and song that your greatest need has been taken care of. I just want you to be so happy and full of joy that that wrath is off you. It's gone. I live in the acceptance and love of God. It's the sweetest feeling you could ever have. We should come in here and it should just be quit singing so loud. You just want to praise Him and worship and declare Him because He has removed His wrath and the way He did it was by not removing it from His Son. That's the love of God. Sing, rejoice in whatever you're facing this morning because of that. And then fourthly, love. Love that Jesus went into that fire for the glory of God and for you. I just want you to love him. I can't imagine how terrifying that cup was. And he entered into it for you. That's got to do something to your heart. That doesn't get a five cents response. That's... I offer up my body a living sacrifice to you, God. This one's been sitting on me. If God could forgive you that much, how can you withhold forgiveness of another? It says that song, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy is now seated at your table. That's what forgiveness does, is it brings you into fellowship. And I just pray that when we look at the forgiveness of God, that we will be characterized by forgiveness of one another. And then lastly, I want you to let the gospel have its way in your soul. This is how you get revived. This is how you get awakened. As you realize the wrath of God that was being revealed. And you can look back to your own life of how shipwrecked it was and how broken it was and how addicted and how messed up I was in my own life and God set me free and lifted that wrath and if he hadn't done that it would have ended in in such an eternal unending wrath of God and if you can just see that God has rescued you from that and the way he did it in his son it's just got to do something to our hearts and our lives and just quit being cold and apathetic and think about this once a week And so I pray, let the gospel have its way in your mind and your heart and your will this morning. Let's pray. Father, I pray for any soul that is still under your wrath this morning. God, please, right now, let them feel it. Convict them of their sin and the judgment that must come from a holy God and righteousness, that their own righteousness will never get them out of this. It'll never be enough to let their good deeds outweigh their bad. Let them be convicted. The only righteousness is the one revealed in the gospel. The righteousness of Jesus Christ that can be theirs by faith this morning. Please, God, deliver them from the wrath that is to come. Let them be delivered from you this morning. Give them eyes to see. Let them call upon you now to save them from their sin and guilt and shame and hiding. 
God, let them look it in the face this morning, but look into the face of Jesus Christ dying on a cross for their sin. Let them believe and be saved from the wrath of God, I pray, O oh Lord. And I pray for your dear ones. O oh God, let them see deeper and truer this gospel. Let it overwhelm them and overtake that, that their lives now are yours and they will use every gift that you've given them. They will use their resources, their, their, their feet and hands and tongue. They will give everything to you in this gospel. God, let us hold nothing back as you withheld nothing of your son for our salvation. God, let the, let the, by the mercies of God, let us offer up these bodies living sacrifices. Lord, awaken us to coldness and, and meandering and lukewarmness of our day. God, let us burn with hot embers for the, for the love of Jesus Christ, who is the gospel. And I thank you, and it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen.